if you're working on your organizational culture, have you considered courage? Today, we're talking about creating a courageous culture. I've got two great guests, which means you're in the right place. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by From Manager to Remarkable Leader, Kevin's flagship workshop based on his proven leadership model. Learn more at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash manager. And now here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're over 200 episodes in, and this is less than five times. I can count them on one hand, the number of times that I've had two guests at once. So today you get a two-for-one situation, and my guests today are Karen Hurt and David Dye. Let me tell you about them, and then we'll dive in. Karen Hurt and David Dye help leaders achieve breakthrough results without losing their soul. They are keynotes, leadership speakers, trainers, and award-winning authors of books, including Courageous Cultures, How to Build Teams of Micro-Innovators, Problem Solvers, and Customer Advocates. It's just about to come out as this is going live. Uh, They've also written Winning Well, A Manager's Guide to Getting Results Without Losing Your Soul. Karen is a top leadership consultant and CEO of Let's Grow Leaders, a former Verizon wireless executive She was named to the Inc. Magazine's list of great leadership speakers. Same list that I'm on. And David is a former executive, elected official, and the president of Let's Grow Leaders, their leadership training and consulting firm. Welcome to both of you. I'm glad to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Our pleasure. It is my pleasure. So, okay. So usually I ask people about the journey of how they ended up doing what they're doing. I'm going to ask you, I mean, you guys can answer that a little bit, but mostly how do you how did you end up finding each other working together tell us a little bit about the journey to the to the partnership if you will yeah so we were both blogging online and uh, so yes we met online but that not that kind of online I would, I, I would have I would have swiped the right direction I would have but that's but not hey that. listen there was a time when that was like an, a, a you know a, was like who does that and now like everybody does that <laughs> well, not me yeah, but, I've been married yeah. 30 plus years but that's a different story. Yeah, so we so we were both blogging, and I and I had started my blog while I was still at Verizon, and David read something that had gotten picked up in like HR.com or one of those things, and he was reading it. And says I don't remember writing this, and he realized as he got to the end, but it was so much like what he would have said. He gets to the bottom, and it's my byline, and so he reached out to me. He said, I think we should know each other. And so we had some, I mean, lovely exchanges, but I was still, I didn't even know that I was leaving Verizon to start this whole thing. And uh, he said, you know, if you ever decide you are going to, because it sounds to me like you might be because your posts are getting edgier, uh, reach out to me. So we ran into each other at a book publishing summit after I had uh, left Verizon. And we was, you know, how to launch your first book, right? And so we got to talking. It was fun to meet in person. And we realized we were pretty much writing the same book. And we thought, oh. so were you, did you know you were going to see each other? Or was this like happenstance that you were at the We same did place? know that we were going to see each other. Yeah. I, I had emailed and uh, I remember that conversation. I said, so I'm going to be talking to some agents and things here at this thing. And she said, oh, is it that conference? I'm going to that too. And so we knew that we were going to be able to, to meet in person for the first time there. And yeah, we talked for a good 20 minutes about uh, book topics and so forth. And went, wow, we're really really aligned here, I, we've got to collaborate on something. And we said, yes, let's do it. So an article, a white paper, something. And uh, we met at another conference uh, a couple, seven months later, and then another conference. And that was at that one for, again, we said, you know, a short interactions, 20, 30, 40 minutes, we've got to collaborate. And Karen called a few months later and said, I'm ready. And I said, for what? She said to collaborate. I said, okay, cool. Uh, I am. Article, <laughs> article, white paper, what are we thinking here? And she said, no, let's do the book. And I said, okay. Uh, you know, we had, we had become familiar enough with each other's approach and writing, but also differences in voice and differences in perspective that we knew that we had 
something there. And so it was a process and, and so on. And the result of that was winning well. So we get through writing winning well. He's living in Colorado. I'm in Maryland, 3,000 miles apart. And we do the whole thing, you know, over chat, you know, some Zoom calls. It never really, you know, but become incredibly good friends during this time. And then lots of things happen in our personal lives in between then. You know, my mother dies. He's got some, all these things happen. And we start, so we're, we're becoming closer and closer friends, having to support one another on this collaborative project and picking up when the other one is in a crisis. And anyway, book publishes, David uh, calls and he says, you know, you'll be so proud of me. I think this girl is asking me out. And I felt like, I said, what? That was, that was actually a big <laughs> achievement for me to recognize what was happening. That tells you a little bit about me. And so you haven't written a book about self-awareness. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Karen, Karen was a great coach, but she was also a great friend. And so that's that, in that conversation. I was, I, was, I was like, I don't think I like that idea. And so I uh, thought about it. And then I said, you know, maybe we should consider being more than co-authors. And so long story short, we um, got married, merged our businesses together, and uh, for the last couple of years have been uh, run, building this business together. And it, it's been a, a tremendous amount of fun because we both bring, although our thought leadership is directly aligned, our skill sets are very different. Very complementary. You yeah. know, in terms of, you know, so that we're able to really bring a different approach to the business. And David does a lot of the operations work and all the tech and I'm marketing and, and that kind of thing. So it, it is a really fun partnership. It's been quite a ride. The things you learn. Every, <laughs> I mean, I knew some of that, but I, but the things, everyone, that you learn, on the, you're, you're welcome, everybody. So, uh, so the new book is called Courageous Cultures and lots of books written about culture. Um, why courageous cultures? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, it really came out because we were noticing a pattern over the last couple of years working with our clients. We would go in and talk with the most senior levels of the organization and we would hear things like, why don't people speak up? Why am I the one who has to stumble across this best practice that nobody is talking about? Not even the people within a five foot radius of the other people who, who are you know, doing the same work. And then we would go into the front line and we would hear things like, why you, nobody ever wants my ideas. The last time I spoke up, I got in trouble. We thought, are you working for the same company? So the leaders you know, want ideas, employees have ideas, and somehow there is something broken. And we wanted to study this phenomenon. Yeah, I wanted to study this phenomenon. So uh, we partnered uh, with the University of North Colorado on an extensive research study to really take a look at who is doing this well, what are the kinds of ideas that are not being shared? Why aren't they being shared? And that was really the impetus uh, for the book. Yeah, and then the, ultimately the goal was to give leaders a practical roadmap of how they can build a courageous culture that shifts from safe silence to consistent contribution from everybody on the team. So that everybody, as the subtitle says, is micro-innovating those day-to-day -day enhancements, improvements and efficiency processes, advocating for customers and solving problems. And every team and every organization is better off when everybody's doing that. So practically, how do you get there? And I appreciate, David, that you used the word practically three times in that sentence, uh, because I think that if you gave me one adjective to describe the book, it would be practical. Uh, because of, of all of, at the end of it, for those of you that don't yet have your copy, which you soon will write, um, Courageous Cultures, Karen Hurt and David Dye, uh, the, the Every chapter, I think every chapter, has uh, an exercise, an actual process that you as a leader can facilitate with your team to help you move forward with some of the ideas that, that uh, you guys are sharing, which, which is really, really wonderful. So uh, I, I also noticed that like me, David, you like alliteration because you have a lot of it in this book. Um, and you just gave two of us, gave us two of those just a minute ago. Um, and so I, I want to get at, well, let's just go here now. Um, you, you talk about a phenomenon called FOSU, which is not for Michigan fans who don't like Ohio State. It is fear of speaking up, fear of speaking up, FOSU. Um, so you've already mentioned, Karen, that this happens. People are afraid to, re to speak up. 
what are what are some more of the causes in, in your research and in your observations as consultants? Why yeah, so, are people afraid to do that? Absolutely. So the, everybody knows FOMO, fear of missing out. So we call it FOSU with the fear of speaking up. And you know that it comes from a variety of, well, we found five causes in our research and our work that uh, definitely uh, left to the fore and, and caught our attention. One of them is that leaders just don't ask. You know, we had 49% uh, of our respondents said that they are not consistently or regularly asked by their leaders for ideas. Well, what does that do? Uh, you know, another one uh, that came to the forefront is that people think that nothing's going to happen. You know, uh, what do we have? 50% of respondents, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 50% of respondents uh, said, you know, if I share an idea, there's just nothing's going to happen with it. So you have that sense of futility. It's and a black people, hole. Why should I share it? It's not going to go anywhere. Exactly. And, you know, one of the interesting things we found uh, when we get to solutions along those lines is sometimes things are happening. And as a leader, your organization might be doing that. We worked with a very large financial institution that had a really robust system for getting employee feedback and input. They were doing a bang up job at that. And they said that half of the ideas they were getting had been implemented already. So they're getting all of this kind of, and they considered it noise in the system. Well, we asked, so are you following up with those folks and letting them know that that valuable idea was so valuable that you're already doing it. And they said, oh, no, we're not. Well, when you think about it, those folks are going to be in this 50% who say, nothing's going to happen if I suggest an idea. But it did. And so if we can do simple things like, you know, just close that loop. Close the feedback loop. Yep. Absolutely. Get more get more folks. You know, two thirds of the respondents said, you know, that their managers operate under the principle that this is the way we've always done it. It's the way we're always going to do it. You know, so you get these kinds of things. We had another 40% who feel that when we talk about fear, 40% straight up said, I lack the confidence to share an idea. And there are a number of reasons for that. Maybe they don't know how, maybe they're not sure where if the idea is relevant, maybe they're not sure how it will be received. And one of the major reasons that we found, and we have found this consistently, is one of the things that we do is we call it a, a fear forage and we uncover the fears. And one of the things that we have found consistently across industry, across countries, uh, did work you know, in, in some EMEA, this big EMEA conference where we had all these countries represented. And one of the biggest things that we found is people tend to hold on to a really negative experience. So you know this, Kevin, right? You have one crappy boss who did one bad thing and it just, it makes, it intimidates people. And even though they could have had four other great bosses, and you know, maybe working for a really good boss now who does want their ideas, they're like, oh, but you know, the last time I did that, and I was having this conversation with this one woman, I said, how long ago was that last time? And she's like, well, it was 10 years ago. And I said, was it at the company you're working at now? And she's like, oh, no, no. And I'm like, oh. Was it for the boss you have now? Oh, no, no, no. 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 And, and so we need to, as leaders, we need to understand that people have that scar tissue, which means that we need to be really working hard to create a psychological, you know, the psychological safety and be very deliberate in asking, you know, this no one ask thing. When we go back to the leaders and we say, you know, here's your survey results. No one asked. They said, we ask. I always say I have an open door. But an open door is permission, <laughs> it's not an invitation. And those are two different things. Expecting great ideas to walk through your door, it's just not going to happen as frequently, you know, out of all of the ideas that are out there. But when you go and ask, I remember when I was an executive and we were doing some work around uh, some insurance renewals that had to be done. And, you know, the insurance industry is changing and premiums were going up and we're trying to figure out what to do. Well, the president... Uh, CEO and I and the CFO, we all sat down and we came up with a great plan on paper. And I remember going and asking someone, another person on the executive team who was a very astute people person, what she thought of the plan. And she said, let me tell you what will happen if we do that. And she talked about specific employees throughout the organization and the direct impact on them, had amazing wisdom con to contribute. We went back to the drawing board, came with a much better plan that was better for everybody and still worked on the spreadsheets, but we would never have known if we hadn't have asked. And so the value of asking as a leader and not relying on permission to walk through the open door is vital. All right, everybody, we could end this right now. You got more than your value. 
you got to ask. And, and uh, listen, I got a hundred stories that just go along all the stuff you guys just said. And let's just take one more about that person that got with the scar tissue. They're mm -hmm. sharing their scar tissue. They're oh, creating yeah. tribal knowledge around that scar tissue, even if it wasn't from the same organization, which no. th that is spreading like a <clears throat> virus, if you will, as well, without question. So uh, you guys talk about clarity and curiosity and how they are hooked together. To me, that was one of the um, one of the really cool things about the work in how they hook together. And, and, and you can't tell us everything that's in the book in relationship to that, but can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, you start, it starts by being really clear about two things. One, clear that you really want people's ideas. So from the minute they enter your organization, you say, this is how we do things around here. We want your ideas. I, in fact, tell me about what you did at your last employer around these three things, because we're looking to learn. So clarity. And then clarity about that you want them and clarity about what a good idea would accomplish. So a lot of the techniques that we teach is not just, do you have any ideas, but, you know, we need ideas right now about how to help people who are working from home with children, right? Now that's very specific. Let's talk about that because now that you've been specific, you're not just saying, does anybody have ideas how to make things better in this crisis? That's really broad and that can feel intimidating to people. So be, be clear about those two things and then being showing up curious, be deliberate about asking. And we have a variety of techniques about how do you do that? Once you get the ideas, then you go back to clarity and say, okay, we found some really good ways of doing things here. Now we got to be clear. We need everybody thinking about doing it this way and be, and re, as you're changing, get back to that clarity phase of things. So two things to underline for all of you that are, that, that are watching or listening. The first one is this, this thing that you just said, um, Karen, about asking people when they arrive about how you did things at the last job, because that's usually the last thing anybody does. Well, that's not how we do it here. Right. You don't understand that because that's not how we do it in this industry. Right. We've been in business for 46 and a half years. And that's like, so just opening with that question where there's something to learn and how that will come across to that new employee is huge. Again, second reason why people have already got more than their value. And, and this, and the, no, I lost the last thing I was going to say, because that was so, good. Um, I, I did lose it. I really did. It's okay. Um, so talk to me about, talk to me about um, how we, how we help them further clarify because you're, I did get my point back yes. now that when you just ask, do you have any ideas? First of all, the answer is yes. It's, you're not really asking for the ideas. You're asking yes or no question. Do they have, right. have one? So, so yeah. the now, idea. Like, help us help us dive in a little bit more to uh, how we help how we help ask the more specific question that will help elicit the ideas. Say a yeah, little bit so more. We share an acronym uh, called IDEA. Uh, speaking of getting ideas, to help people that think through and give their idea the most traction. I got the bookmark right there. <laughs> So whether you are a leader who you're, you think you've got a great idea percolating and you want to share it in a way that's going to give it the most legs, or you're trying to help your team think more strategically and share more meaningful ideas, this acronym is for you. I stands for interesting. And by interesting, we mean, is it strategically relevant? Does it help achieve a significant goal? So that's what Karen was talking about a moment ago, that clarity of what matters most, where do we need great ideas? D is doable. Is this something that our team has agency over? Can we do this in some fashion? If it's changing regulations at the state capitol or in, in Washington, that might, that's a whole different ballgame. What can we do? So let's focus on doable. E is engaging. How does this engage other stakeholders? How does it get them involved? What's fascinating for them? What, how are they going to get on board? And if they aren't initially, what do I need to do with my idea to get there? Do I need to have some conversations to get hook them in? And then A is actions. And that is specifically suggesting the next one to three next steps it's going to take to make progress on this. So if you'll do those things, it's strategically relevant. You know you can do something with it. You've got your stakeholders on board and you've outlined the next couple of steps. Somebody brings you that idea, 
a lot more likely you're going to take it seriously and be able to follow up with it. When you share that idea, much more likely that your leadership is going to be able to take action and do something. Yeah. Uh, an, another, but, another technique that uh, we have found has really been resonating with people as we've been sharing is the, called the patient perspective. And this came out, I was on a walk with my sister uh, as we were writing the book, and I was explaining what the courageous cultures were. And she's like, I think we do this. And she's a director of rehab at, a, at Wellspan Hospital. And she says, in, if we have a really strategic, important meeting, we assign one person in that meeting to operate only as the patient. So maybe the person's day job is they're the director of IT, but in that meeting, they're not allowed to talk IT. They're only allowed to be the patient, right? And so she said, we were implementing a new um, employee, I mean, a new scheduling system so that for their inpatients, they could, would know and they wouldn't go to go do rehab and find an empty room because the person was at getting lab tests, right? And so the, they were talking about how to execute this. And she said, the patient raised his hand and said, I want to know my schedule too. And everybody in the room went, oh no. <laughs> You know, if we give the pay, you know, oh, we're going to have, what if we're wrong? What if it changes? He's like, I get all that. It's like, but even if it's 80% right, it gives me more control than I have now. And guess what? I'm already feeling out of control because I have cancer. 100% out of control. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, and she said, so they did. They took that patient's perspective and they made it so that the patients had visibility to the schedule. She said, patient satisfaction scores immediately went up. And she said, it wasn't, um, it's not perfect, but it's still a work in progress, but she said it's, it's radically better. And she said, we wouldn't have gotten there, she doesn't think, if they hadn't had that mindset. Someone's got to wear that hat. So yeah. I, I want to make, uh, make a point about that, and that is that leaders make this mistake. I'm, 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 I'm jumping away from that just a little, but I want to give everyone a principle I think is super important that you just highlighted, Karen. That is that leaders make this mistake all the time. I don't want to tell them because I don't have all the answers. But what people want is the fact that, number one, to know that you're thinking about it. And number two, that um, you have some knowledge. And if you'll pull back the curtain a little bit, they won't be out there worrying, anxious, gossiping. And rather, they know as much as people talk about being transparent and all that stuff. And that's true. But this is a practical example of it. And this is just another way. It's, it's the same principle applied back to us as leaders all day long. We don't share because we don't have all the answers. Just like they didn't want to share with the patient because it might not be perfect. Mm -hmm. Way better to have something than to have nothing. Yeah, that's, that's a great important. point, Kevin. Absolutely. The yeah. other thing that I love about the idea formula is, I mean, if I had to pick, I'd pick the E. Because, and, and David, the way you described it before you came back to summarize it by talking stakeholder because people will nod their heads and say, oh, yeah, stakeholders. But the idea, uh, a lot of times, my idea or our idea, and we are in love with our idea. But we haven't done this I thought of, how is it going to impact others? What are the unintended consequences that we haven't even considered? Um, our intentions are good. We think everything's good about it, but we haven't thought that through. So back to, even back to your point uh, earlier, David, where you asked someone else in the organization, said, well, this is how people are going to actually see it. Oh, right. It was an example of that same principle in action, which is really, really good stuff. So um, you both know, and many people who are listening or watching know that I wrote a book, co-wrote a book called The Long Distance Leader. And so in this time, uh, in the middle of July, as this comes out, we're still dealing with this thing called COVID-19. We're still dealing with people working from home, maybe for a long time. So here's my question. If we're trying to build courageous, excuse me, courageous cultures, is there anything or what's different about it if we're doing it at a distance? What's the long distance difference? Yeah, and one of the things that we talk about in the book is called practice the principle. And the idea here is that core fundamental leadership behaviors and culture building behaviors, they transcend whether we're working side by side or we're working remotely. Whether we're working in a time of abundance or a time of scarcity, those things, or whether we're you know, in a biker bar or we're in you know, a Fortune 50 company. <clears throat> principles are principles. And so when you're talking about the principles of a courageous culture, things like navigating your own narrative, tapping into your own courage, making sure you're aware of the, the baggage that we talked about with other people, it doesn't matter if you're 
sitting next to the person or you're like we are right now over a remote connection. To have those conversations and do that is vital. To ask courageous questions, to go on curiosity tours, to use the patient perspective, to help people with the idea model. All of those tools and practices are available to you. When somebody shares an idea, how do you respond to it? Uh, alliteration, you mentioned earlier, we could call it respond with regard. If someone shares an idea, there's four things that can happen with that idea. One of them is that it's already been implemented. Well, let them know. Again, doesn't matter if we're next to one another or remote. If the idea is incomplete, give them more information and thank them for, sh for trying and invite them to continue thinking and come up with a better solution. If you're gonna do something with the idea, how can they participate or be aware of that trial or test? Or if the idea just isn't aligned and you can't do anything with it, to again, thank them. Hey, I appreciate that you were thinking about it. Uh, here's where we're going. This is the strategic direction. This is where we really need ideas. If we were going this way, it'd be great. If we're going this way, can you help with that? Love to get your input and your thoughts there. Again, those are things that transcend location. Yeah, and I think the other thing is you almost have to do everything a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you, you need connection more. You've got to work harder. And you and I talked about that when we did our Asking for a Friend, right? You were talking about how you have to be so deliberate about making the human connection now. And I think that's part of it. It's being really sensitive. It's easier to hide on Zoom if you've got 30, 30 little heads on Zoom, right, in a meeting. <laughs> Um, it's easy for person number 27 to just disappear. And so like one of the things we do in our remote programs is we keep a list of all the participants and we're making marks when people are talking, you know, and so that we are aware that John hasn't said anything, you know, and so, hey, John, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but first I want to hear from the people who have their hands up, but John, I, I want to make sure I get your perspective. So you're not just like, boom putting it on them, but they see it coming and have a chance if they're introverted and time to get their thoughts together. So I think you have to do some of that. And the other thing I would say around the remote and the fear is, you know, a lot of what you've got to be doing is making the invisible visible. And sometimes you do that in, in, a, in a way that people can still be anonymous if you aren't in a courageous culture yet. That's a little bit harder remote because you're, you want to gather the input. So we're working with a, an executive team right now where they are going to send us, um, we've got a way to collect technology, but they're gonna send us their biggest hopes and fears for the next 18 months. And we're, we are the only ones who'll know who those fear, hopes right. and fears came from. You know, so find ways to do that in a safe way. And you know, what comes in that way, then we're gonna give the themes back and then we're gonna talk about that in a workshop that we're doing with them. You know, you can do that, you know, easier face to face, but there's still ways through technology you can do that and protect the anonymity. For sure. And that's, that's a way that we've used and, you know, it all depends on exactly how much fear and lack of trust there is, but yep. there's ways to do that. And in some ways it almost might be easier remotely because even if you were in the same office, you'd use the same tools you're using remotely now. Probably. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, okay. I've got a couple more questions for you guys. Okay. And the next one is, so when you're not, writing books and you know, building studios and all that. Um, what do you guys do for fun? Uh, we love to travel and just we're, right we're, now, what do you do? <laughs> I know, right? So we, we love to scuba dive. That's my favorite thing. I am an underwater scuba photographer. So I like to take pictures of fish. Um, but and I, I love the scuba diving too, but uh, I, my number one is hiking. I love, I'm from Colorado originally, and I love hiking up 14,000 foot mountains and, uh, and being out in nature. And, and that's my number one. And fortunately, we're still in a position here in Maryland, even with all of the uh, safer at home strictures that can still get out in nature and still run and, and uh, take time near the streams and hear the birds and smell the trees. So now everybody that was wondering, since there was one on the East Coast and one in Colorado, who won? Well, apparently Karen won that part of the part of the race. For okay, now. for now, <laughs> we get back and forth as uh, much as uh, right now. COVID isn't allowing it, but our our uh, we we definitely want to get into the mountains back in Colorado at some point in the future eventually. All right, awesome. So I the only question I told you I was going to ask you I'm asked now and I ask both of you I'm going to ask David to go first so what are you reading these days David well this this gets to another thing that I do to uh, enjoy myself and, and I love to cook 
Uh, and when we're nor in a normal schedule, we are traveling constantly uh, to clients and conferences and, and so forth. And obviously we haven't been doing that. Nobody has for the, the last couple of months. And so that has allowed me time to pursue one of the things that I'm passionate about, which is cooking specifically right now, baking artisan bread. So my book is uh, Tartan Bread by Chad Robertson, who owns a bakery in uh, North California there in uh, uh, San Francisco, makes phenomenal bread and I love his methodology. And I've been honing in that recipe for a whole wheat seeded loaf, six seeds, I'll tell you more later. All right, awesome. And um, I'm guessing you're eating the bread, but not reading about the bread, Karen. Is that I right? I am what not you... reading about the bread. I can think of more exciting things to read about, but um, the bread is delicious. I will give that, that is for sure. So I really am resonating with, you know, uh, Dr. Amy Edmondson's book on psychological safety. And uh, she actually wrote the foreword to our book. And when we read her foreword, we were like, oh my gosh, this She's like nailed it. And uh, so really impressed by just the depth of research that she's been doing over the last 20 years. And so I'm, I'm paying very close attention, not just obviously I've already read the book, but paying very close attention to how she's showing up on LinkedIn now. And, you know, who is she reading and how is she commenting on things? And, and um, she hangs out with some pretty interesting people. And so that's, uh, that's been really fun just to get the depth of the uh, ongoing conversation around psychological safety, particularly how it's hanging, coming out now in this crazy time. So one last question for you guys. Uh, how can people learn more about your work? How can people get a hold of a copy of the book, Courageous Cultures? How can people connect with you guys? Yeah, so our, our book website is uh, CourageousCulturesBook.com or you can go to Let'sGrowLeaders.com and we would love to connect with you there on LinkedIn, uh, very active on LinkedIn too. So um, Karen with an I, that's how you find that. But uh, would love to, um, you can, at our website, you can get a free chapter of the book. You, there's a, a Courageous Cultures quiz you can take. Uh, there's an idea inspiration summit. You can have lots of free things so you can dip your toe in and see what it's all about. Awesome. So I want to tell everybody that Norm oftentimes, of course, I don't, we don't know when you're watching or listening, of course, but if you're a person who is subscribed to this podcast, which of course you should be, um, but if you are and you're consuming this right around the time it comes out, you're getting the chance to hear about this before the book is actually out at the end of July. And so if that's the case, you want to get your copy. Don't wait because they, I will tell you, authors love it when you pre-order their book. So if you're hearing this in the second half of July, don't wait till it comes out. Order your copy today. And if you do, go to CourageousCulturesBook.com and we have some special bonuses just for you if you pre-order. So you've got time. See, there you go, everybody. Uh, so now a question for all of you who are watching and listening. The most important question of the day. Now what? What are you gonna do with this? And maybe you're gonna challenge yourself to ask more often more questions, including for ideas. Maybe you're gonna think about how to engage others more. Maybe you're gonna help people. You're gonna to try to understand what the fears that they might have and what's holding them back from sharing their ideas are. Whatever it is, the most valuable thing that you can do right now is to take some action on the wisdom that you heard on this call. I hope you'll do that. And uh, so Karen and David, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure oh, to have thank you. Thank you. It was really fun to talk with you. And everybody, we are going to be back again. But before I come back, you really ought to join us on social media. Like, you want to know what we're doing? You want to maybe get some inside scoop? You might even want to tell us who we ought to have on. All of those things are available to you. And you can even pick your platform. Facebook, LinkedIn, we don't care. Go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to Join us there. We'd love to have you as a member. And I'd really love to have you back next week for the, another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.